So these are my wrap-up notes for Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and by now you have read the text and done some research on the text yourself or listened to face-to-face uh, -face lecture. So these are my wrap-up notes to sort of codify some of the things that we can think about, these broad topics, uh, any of which are areas of further inquiry and, and areas with which uh, you can develop uh, various arguments that you can make pertaining to the text. So these are broad topics and are not in any particular order. Uh, as I've said in my earlier wrap-up videos, that these categories are not exclusive of one another. Uh, they can be reordered and, and uh, put underneath other categories, depending on uh, your perception or your argument of the text. So let's start with some, um, you know, with some of these uh, general topics. Clearly, this text is about alienation and solitude. And I think that the uh, Mary Shelley very expertly created the monster of Frankenstein. Um, very problematic, very complex for us. Uh, we as the reader, we identify with the solitude and the loneliness and the alienation that the monster feels. Now, if you say, okay, well, the monster is the monster and he's done some terrible things. This novel, however, is a kind of sliding scale and that one character often can sub be substituted for another character. What is Walton doing at the beginning of the text? He is lonely. He's looking for a friend. He exhibits the same sort of feelings that the monster of Frankenstein exhibits, and in many ways that Elizabeth does, and in many ways that Dr. Frankenstein does. So this is a novel, I would argue, about alienation and solitude, whether we think about it as a uh, scale of gradation or that one character can be substituted for another. And really, I think that's more, more the case. This is a novel about family and domesticity. It's about the domestic space. What is it that, uh, you know, so first of all, Dr. Frankenstein comes from a family. Now, the majority of the text, he's running away from his family. There's something about his family that he's trying to get away from. But Elizabeth is interested in domesticity, right? I mean, she wants to marry Dr. Frankenstein. She wants to have a family. She wants to have a future and children. Dr. Frankenstein is not necessarily interested in that. Who is interested in that? The monster of Frankenstein. Um, there are moments in this text uh, with the de Lacy family. The de Lacy family is really an exemplar of domesticity. And this is what the monster of Frankenstein is interested in achieving. This is what I would argue is what Dr. Frankenstein is not interested in. This is a novel about family and the desire for domesticity or the feeling against domesticity. This novel, as I've discussed before, is rooted in the Romantic tradition. And within the Romantic tradition, even though this is a Gothic text, the Gothic, uh, a kind of subset of Romanticism, that the Romantic text is concerned with nature. And nature plays, I think, a prominent role in this text in a variety of different ways. First of all, nature is a space for contemplation. What is it that Dr. Frankenstein does? And this is also a consequence of his class, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But what is it that Dr. Frankenstein does uh, when he's upset? Uh, he goes out into the natural world. Um, this is um, a transcendentalist feeling. This is a romantic feeling. Uh, this is a Taoist feeling to go out into, this is a modern feeling, to go out into the natural world as a kind of reset, to escape the ins and outs uh, of daily life, the pressures of, of daily life. And just as we talked about uh, with lines composed above Tintern Abbey by William Wordsworth. He's been gone from this space for five years. He goes to this place in nature to feel better and to make sense of the world. So nature is a space for contemplation. It's also a background against human folly, um, that nature, uh, at least in, in a human scale, does not change. Um, it is sublime. It is giant. It is overwhelming. It is beautiful, and humans, people, 
uh, we kind of do dumb things. And, um, you know, maybe this is a conversation uh, uh, that having to do with theology even. Uh, the theological or religious realm perhaps exists in nature. Nature is a place where people try to survive. Uh, this is part, uh, you know, people are exploring different parts of the world. Um, we have uh, a tradition uh, in, the, uh, in uh, American literature, <clears throat> whether we're talking about Moby Dick or Jack London, that people go out into nature and that this is a survival story. And this fits into that tradition. Um, nature is also a place that facilitates a desire for perversion. And let me give you an example. I think a very strong symbol, a moment in the text, is when Dr. Frankenstein, when he's young, he witnesses the destruction of a, I believe it's an oak tree, but let's call it a tree. And um, lightning comes down and destroys the tree. Now, in, on one hand, we could look at that and, and maybe in a very sort of uh, benign uh, romantic tradition, we'd say the power of nature is immense and people are small and we have to respect nature. For Dr. Frankenstein, uh, that symbol becomes something that, that creates a desire to duplicate, to be able to control. So while the lightning destroys the tree, rather than being awe of the natural processes of nature, this then facilitates the desire for perversion. And Dr. Frankenstein at some point in his maturation says, I'm going to do that. I'm going to reproduce that. Electricity, the power of nature can destroy. And then the consequence of that is I can create. And then we see how that works out. This is a novel about social class and social uh, oppression. Uh, I mentioned a moment earlier, what is it that Dr. Frankenstein does when things don't go his way? And, and uh, you know, if we had a dollar for every time he said in the novel, I am wretched, I am miserable, um, he goes on vacation. Is that what most people can do when things go bad year after year, most of the time because of your own doing? No, they take a day off from work and they go back to work, they go back to school and they grind it out. Dr. Frankenstein doesn't have to do that because of his social class. He's from uh, an affluent class, uh, a leisure class, and he can go on a tour, he can go to Europe, he can do all sorts of different things. Not everybody, both in the real world, the, the, the sort of real world that you and I live in, and in the literary world created um, in, uh, in this text, they can't do that. And they have to abide by a different set of rules. Um, Legal protections. This may sound familiar to us. Legal protections do not operate in the same way for poor people as they do for affluent people. And uh, the situation with Justine, I think, is an example of that, where she is charged with a crime and really has no defense. Um, just a quote, uh, a couple of quotes here. Men appear to me as monsters thirsting for each other's blood. Uh, this, I think, uh, in a general sense, is how the monster understands humanity. And I think also in a social sense uh, that, you know, I am above the fray, the petty fray uh, of fighting because I am from an affluent class. Uh, as I said, um, when things, when the going gets tough, Dr. Frankenstein retires to Belle Rive and to other places uh, in the text. There's also this, you know, he, he comes across laborers singing and the sentiment that farmers are good and farmers are happy. He doesn't know any farmers. He doesn't know any laborers. He just makes these comments like, oh, they must be happy because they're, they're singing and, and being a farmer is, is pure and it's part of the pastoral tradition. Um, some of you might be farmers. Farming is pretty hard and um, it's awfully difficult at least uh, in the United States and in places around the world, it's awfully difficult to make a living, um, to make a lot of money by farming. It's a very difficult enterprise. But this is, uh, this is unknown to Dr. Frankenstein. He, uh, 
he just sees these people and, oh, they must be happy and they're working the land. Dr. Frankenstein has no idea. There's a kind of strict protocol for the wealthy here. And I'm wondering that if there's not a kind of fantasy that Dr. Frankenstein has with uh, the poor class, with those of the lower socioeconomic class, because he, in a way, he kind of idealizes them. Now, he doesn't know them at all. He knows no farmers. He doesn't know laborers. He fantasizes about that. They must be happy, as opposed to me, Dr. Frankenstein, who's not happy. And that becomes a kind of question. Well, why isn't Dr. Frankenstein happy? Or, or is there an argument that you can make uh, that's, uh, that, that says Dr. Frankenstein is not happy. Well, the argument that I would make is um, he really doesn't want to marry Elizabeth. I mean, if you're in love with somebody and want to marry them, typically you don't spend years and years away from that person, from your significant other-to-be. Uh, he has an ambivalent relationship with his father, uh, a, both a kind of love-hate, uh, ambivalent, a term used uh, often in psychoanalytic theory, in a way to describe... Uh, the relationship uh, between a child and their parents that the child both loves and hates them. Um, but there's a kind of fantasy here. And, and maybe, and, and part of that with the, the reaction that Dr. Frankenstein has uh, to his mother's death, not a whole lot there. So maybe there's a kind of fantasy here set up between Dr. Frankenstein and the different social classes that he wishes he could be like them. Maybe in this fantasy, he thinks that they don't have the kinds of responsibilities that he has. What might those responsibilities be? I don't know. Uh, invent something. Go to school. Become a doctor. Marry Elizabeth. All sorts of different possibilities. Okay, this is a novel about optics of the body. What is beauty? What is ugliness? And I think we can think about this in a couple of different ways. First of all, I think it's really quite interesting uh, to think about this in terms of film. Uh, and, and here on the screen, I have uh, several different examples, um, several different examples of the ways with which the monster of Frankenstein has been imagined. And this, uh, I think, would make a great, uh, a great paper. Uh, to produce an argument about how Frankenstein has, the monster of Frankenstein has been imagined in different generations based on different cultural or generational ideas about beauty. And so you can see here from these images, uh, some are, uh, quote unquote, more ugly than others. In fact, one of the uh, iterations of the monster of Frankenstein is really not that ugly at all. He has a nice set of abs. Um, so that's something for us to consider. The novel, and this is uh, one of the many, many reasons why I think this novel is uh, really such a modern novel. Um, isn't one of the sort of concerns we have in our society uh, about the way we judge other people based on how they look? Isn't this exactly what's going on in this text? I don't even have a name. I'm just the monster of Frankenstein. Here I am. What is the reaction that people have when they see him? Now, I, I think the monster of Frankenstein becomes, at certain points, a very sympathetic, caring, kind-hearted individual. But we never get to that, do we? Because most of the time, um, in fact, all of the time, until we get to the end where Walton sort of stomachs looking at the monster of Frankenstein, every single time somebody looks, in, including his creator, his father figure, looks at the monster of Frankenstein, what is it that they do? They're horrified. They run away. Um, in the De Lacy family, he's making progress with the father, and then the children come home. So we know that the father finds him a sympathetic figure, but when the children come home, they see the monster of Frankenstein and they completely freak out. 
So my question is, how can something be so ugly that everybody's reaction is not only fear, but often violence? And here's, I think, one of the ways that we can answer this question. Could we say that, I mean, clearly, uh, you know, uh, the monster of Frankenstein is not going to win any beauty contest. I mean, he's made up of maybe animal parts and he's sewn together. Okay, maybe. But could we say that the monster is a reflection of those that look at him? Could we say that the monster is a reflection of those that look at him? So then why would people react so horribly when they see the monster? Well, if the monster is a reflection, then this becomes a kind of social critique about society and about the human condition, that people react in fear and in violence because they see themselves or the worst of themselves in the facade of the monster. And that, I think, adds another layer of some significant complexity and is a harsh critique of the human condition. You know, if we expand our understanding of, uh, if we sort of expand this idea of the reaction against the monster of Frankenstein, that it has to do with the judgment of beauty or even a reflection of our own ugliness um, that is projected onto the monster and we re react to what's inside of ourselves. Really, I think the larger question here is, what does it mean to be an other? That in a society of a majority group of people, what does it mean when you are different? So again, this is why another important reason why the, uh, the novel is so important. Because in our society, in the United States, there's all sorts of people that are different from one another. Um, and so this novel, there's all sorts of people that are different from one another all over the world. And yet, you know, countries and regions and communities are drawing lines in the sand and saying, you are different. You don't look like me. You are different. And people have different kinds of reactions to those people. This is a novel that asks, I think, the fundamental questions. What does it mean to be different? And is it right that we treat people who are different than us in that way. And being another could be um, uh, a person who is handicapped or of a different gender or a different sexual orientation, uh, different ethnicity or a different race. The list just goes on and on. I think fundamentally, the novel Frankenstein asks those questions. What does it mean to be different? And is this right? that people react against an other's difference in this way. Again, uh, a very, very modern novel and thinking about it in that way. This is certainly a novel about violence. And um, uh, this is a quote from the monster of Frankenstein in his uh, telling of how he killed William or a moment during the killing of William. I grasped his throat to silence him. Um, so, uh, again, the sort of employs, uh, we can employ theories of violence that once violence begins, for instance, it can't be contained and it sort of leaks, if you will, uh, you know, within other areas of society and there are reactions of violence against the violence and there's no, there's no ending to it. Uh, and then we can also bring in, you know, theories of trauma that violence traumatizes not just the victim, but also uh, perpetrators as well, that the entire system is changed both through uh, the act of violence and the consequential emotional reaction we know as trauma. This is a novel that questions madness as a social and a biological category. Who is mad? What is madness? What is insanity? Is the monster of Frankenstein insane? Is Dr. Frankenstein insane. So we have to be careful. We're not pulling out the DSM-5 to say that uh, Dr. Frankenstein suffers from a borderline personality disorder with, uh, uh, um, you know, depressive tendencies. We're not doing that. Um, we're, not, we're not diagnosing 
uh, Dr. Frankenstein in that way, he's not a real person. He's a literary character, but I think it's important uh, to think about that this novel questions the definition of insanity and mental health and, and all of those sorts of things. Again, another important reason why this novel is so modern. Um, this novel um, in the education, and I think this is really just such a, a fascinating uh, series of moments in the text where the monster of Frankenstein first comes into consciousness and I think this is just so interesting. This is not a child, the description of a baby opening his or her eyes to the world and hearing a sound. This is a mature mind without language describing uh, his own birth. Uh, really quite fast. We, we, we cannot describe our own birth. Our brains were not there enough to do so. We don't remember it. Uh, we don't remember things until we're five or six or seven and then and then you know, perhaps only fleetingly. Um, but a mature mind is aware of things. The monster Frankenstein, as he is born or brought into the world or, or animated or what have you, and then he learns the various tools with which to communicate the things that, that uh, he experiences. He also learns, and I think this is fascinating in, in so many different ways because um, it reminds me uh, of something from uh, Shuangzhu, uh, and also really something from Confucius, that you know, learning is something uh, slow and unhurried. That if you want to learn something, you really want to have, you know, you really have to want to learn it. You know, oftentimes, and I think again, this is how this uh, novel is very modern. You know, we don't have time often to learn things. Maybe we take shortcuts. Maybe we're not listening to this video. I have no idea. But to learn something, I mean, the monster wants to learn. And he has to work. There's no online course for him to take about world history or world literature. There's no language class that he can take. He really wants to learn. And the desire to learn, uh, I think, is really fascinating. Perhaps something in our modern society, how we have to go, go, go. Perhaps we've lost a little bit of that. At the same time, what is it that the monster of Frankenstein learns? He learns um, about world history, about the, quote, slothful Asiatics. He learns about war. He learns about uh, the Roman Empire. He learns about how humanity is the history of humanity is a history of oppression and war and genocide. This begins both a reaction against the violent history that he reads about and an interpolation, an insertion that he learns that, you know, he uses the language of slothful Asiatics. So he begins to incorporate racial division in a pejorative way in his own understanding of the world. He recognizes the negative aspects of world history, but at the same time, he's incorporating the prejudices, biases, so on and so forth that he reads about. It's almost as if he has no power not to. So this is, uh, I think this is um, a scary moment, really. Science versus uh, primal man. So a quote here, she was there, lifeless, uh, I fainted. Okay, so what do I mean by this? Um, so this, uh, this quote comes from a moment where Elizabeth uh, has just been killed. Very interesting, I think, because the monster has promised Dr. Frankenstein that if you don't make me a companion, going back to the earlier concept of uh, of, of uh, alienation and solitude and loneliness. If you don't make me a companion, I'm going to kill your significant other on your wedding night. And what does Dr. Frankenstein do to protect Elizabeth? I would argue nothing. He doesn't do anything. He destroys 
the companion that he was making for the monster of Frankenstein. And then <clears throat> they're in their sort of honeymoon suite, and Dr. Frankenstein is sort of pacing around. Now, first of all, he knows that he knows that the monster has uh, extraordinary power. Did it occur to you, Dr. Frankenstein, that there was nothing you could do to fight the violence the monster was going to bring? So I think that's a, an interesting point here. The second point, uh, again, is he didn't really do anything to protect Elizabeth. In a way, he opened up more opportunity for Elizabeth to die. I'll get to that a little bit later. But what do I mean by science versus the primal man? What is fainting? And with what gender do we typically, in the tradition, not right or wrong, but in, in the tradition, typically, who might we associate fainting with? In the tradition, we might associate fainting with a woman. So if Dr. Frankenstein faints, we might say that this is not very manly. Or in a more uh, literary vernacular, we might say that Dr. Frankenstein has been emasculated, that he has engaged in an activity that is more womanlike rather than the constructing of his masculinity. And so the question I think, or one of the questions that we can ask is, if primal man is strong and survives, what has science done to primal man? Well, in this case, it has made Dr. Frankenstein weak. In this way, it has emasculated him. So that's what I mean by science versus primal man. And of course, this is a novel about technology. And here I have uh, an image of uh, uh, artificial uh, intelligence. And this asks, again, another important reason why this novel is so important and so modern uh, what are the responsibilities that we have with technology? Uh, what are the limits? What are the consequences when we go beyond those limits? Uh, are there ethics? What happens when technology exceeds? And I think we can look at this, I think, in a couple of different ways. Um, there has always been a kind of anxiety, um, whether we're talking about World War I, and mustard gas and phosphine gas and and uh, you know machine guns and things like that, um, or World War II with uh, the atomic bomb, <clears throat> all sorts of anxiety about what happens when we take the technology too far. Um, you know, in the tradition, you know, let, let, let's you know think about uh, science fiction uh, novels or science fiction movies like The Terminator. What happens when you build an artificial intelligence that decides that humanity is uh, imperfect, a drag on existence? So the technology exceeds its, you know, the capacity of humans to control it. So there's, there's, there's been a, a kind of anxiety about what happens. And what I think is interesting is we're moving towards that. You know, as we, as, when I say we, as society, as scientists, get closer and closer to the master algorithm where artificial intelligence will gain a kind of consciousness, what's going to happen? I mean, do we look back at like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and say, way back then, I told you so? Are we going to go all the way back to the Odyssey? And we look at Hephaestus and in his workshop, the little golden daughters that are like little golden robots, this kind of fantasy to create and circumvent the natural processes. What happens when those inventions exceed uh, the, the boundaries set by the creator, by society? Are we going to look back and say, well, we've created a whole bunch of artificial intelligence that has taken over the world or, or monsters of Frankenstein? What are we going to do then? This novel, I think, poses that very important question. I think that this novel, it's a, it's a very fruitful novel in terms of understanding the family dynamics, the, the very special relationship, uh, relationships within family, between a father and a son, how sons rebel against their fathers. Is this 
uh, in part a novel about that rebellious state of maturation. Uh, do not read uh, Cornelius Agrippa. Okay, Dad, I'll be home by 11. Don't worry about it. I'm going to go read Cornelius Agrippa. The very special relationship between a mother and her son, dealing with issues of abandonment. And, and I mentioned earlier uh, the lack of uh, emotion exhibited by Dr. Frankenstein when his mother dies. And, and the, this, I think, is an important quote, that grief is rather an indulgence than a necessity. What does it mean to be an orphan? And we have that with uh, Justine, and, and in some ways we have that with Elizabeth. Uh, what happens when the person is taken out of their nuclear family? Uh, what are the processes in place for that person to adopt a mother figure or a father figure. It doesn't have to be uh, a mother or a father. It just has to be somebody that uh, is a kind of mentor. Can somebody develop and be happy and healthy without a mom or a dad? Yeah, it's certainly possible. It's much more helpful if they have a mother or a father figure, but this is a novel that I think we can look at these different dynamics to try to understand uh, you know, their sort of uh, operations. And I think it's also fruitful to think about the relationship between Dr. Frankenstein and Elizabeth, almost as brother and sister. They grew up together. Now, they're not biological brother and sister, but they grew up together. So socially, even though Elizabeth is expecting and maybe loves Dr. Frankenstein, I'm wondering if Dr. Frankenstein doesn't really love Elizabeth because he looks at her more like a sister rather than a lover. So uh, family dynamics. Again, friendship. <clears throat> uh, this novel is about male camaraderie. We see this in the beginning of the text with Walton saying, I am looking for a friend. I am alone. Of course, it's a, a little uh, suspect. Why are you going to the ends of the earth to look for a friend? Who are you going to find? Uh, it's you know much better to make a friend, so I'm told, uh, I've heard, that it's much easier to make a friend if you go to class and you make a friend or somebody at work or you know uh, at um, uh, one of those places. Uh, this is a novel about community. And often different communities are uh, at odds with one another. This is um, this is a novel about love, and I have here uh, the love between a man and a woman. I would also suggest, and I think there's a very strong argument that can be made about a kind of homoerotic or homosexual love that Walton feels uh, that he may not really be aware of. I just uh, I just made uh, a comment a, a moment ago that Walton is lonely, he's looking for a friend, why go to the end of the world? Um, maybe he's running away from something. Now, he's also seeking something. He's seeking glory, he's an explorer, he exhibits the same sort of desires that Dr. Frankenstein exhibits in terms of wanting to be great. But he's also running away from something. And he seems to need, uh, at the end of the novel, uh, you know, he, he seems to be pretty torn up when Dr. Frankenstein dies. And, and, you know, Dr. Frankenstein, you know, comes to a ship in the beginning. And he's telling him all of these stories. And Walton, I would argue, almost falls in love with him. So perhaps uh, that's something that we can think about. Uh, to think about the mind and psychology um, and throughout my comments in this, um, you know, in, in my wrap up, uh, comments. I think we can see this uh, interwoven throughout. A quote here, the form of the monster whom I had bestowed existence with ever before my eyes. Um, you know, what does this mean? This is Dr. Frankenstein. This is, this is guilt. This is shame. This is fear. And so uh, again, in, in a psychological or psychoanalytic fashion, uh, there's a lot that can be done, a lot of different ways that we can think about this novel. Yeah, I mean, so many different ways for us to think about this novel, so many different directions. Um, we have to think about the modes of transmission, that these are a series of letters. Um, this is 
Walton writing down the story of Dr. Frankenstein. Dr. Frankenstein gets some of the story from what he says is directly from the monster. We actually don't hear, quote unquote, hear the monster's voice until he shows up at the end of the novel telling Walton his side of the story. But this is completely through the consciousness, through the filter of Walton. What does this all mean? Why is, why is it so important for Walton to tell this story? And is he telling a truthful story? It, <clears throat> is Walton telling the story of the monster of Frankenstein and Dr. Frankenstein? Or because he's writing this down, because he's editing this story, of course he's editing it. He's including, making decisions about including some things and not others. Does this become Walton's story? It's also, I think, important to think about this as a series of confessions and the power relations between the person who is giving the confession and the person that is listening to the confession. I mentioned a little bit earlier, the failure of legal institutions. This is a quote from Justine. <clears throat> God knows how entirely I am uh, innocent. This is um, a failure of law to uh, find the uh, rightfully accused. They've executed somebody who is completely innocent. And there was very, very little done to see if she was innocent or not. I mean, the monster of Frankenstein expertly framed her, but this is an indication that legal institutions have failed. Uh, for us to think about the role of women and children, Justine, Elizabeth, uh, William. The acquisition of language, naming things. Uh, mentioned earlier about education. Um, really quite fascinating in this text, the desire to learn how to name things and in a way gain some power over the things that you see. I mean, if you think about before the acquisition of language, and this is impossible for us to do because we don't really remember it. We don't remember our first words. We don't remember, <clears throat> you know, saying our first sentence. But the child who can name his or her environment then gains control over that environment. For instance, I'm just going to cry because I am hungry. And you hope that mom and dad know that I'm hungry. When I learn, when I gain the ability to speak and learn words, I can say food. And then what happens? Somebody reacts. <clears throat> this is a novel that outlines, I think, uh, or describes that process of the acquisition of language and naming things. Uh, again, this is a failure, uh, also another institution. It's a failure of religion. Why is it that um, uh, Justine confesses? Well, she confesses because she doesn't want to go to hell and she wants to be saved when she dies, but the whole thing is a lie. <clears throat> so what this novel does is it deconstructs these large institutions, family, uh, law, religion, that these things fail the people within community, within society. Um, this is a novel about the past, about memory, the things that Walton remembers, the things that Dr. Frankenstein and the monster remember about their stories. And this is the desire and the fear that Walton has, right? He says to his sister, Margaret, remember me, remember me. It's a phrase that he uses several times. He doesn't want his sister to forget him if he dies. This, I think, is also an expression of his fear that he doesn't forget himself. He doesn't lose himself, perhaps in the way that Dr. Frankenstein does. Okay, uh, I think um, we're coming in for a landing here. One or two slides left. Um, construction of identity. What does it mean? What is an what is an identity? How is identity constructed? Is it constructed through the maturation process? Do we have different identities depending on uh, the social or familial context that we exist in? 
Um, quote, I became acquainted with the science of anatomy. I do not ever remember to have trembled at a tale of superstition, unquote. This is from Dr. Frankenstein in the early part of his career, uh, stating that he's, uh, you know, dark and scary things don't, uh, dark and scary things uh, don't, uh, don't frighten him. Um, but he has a kind of dual identity here, right? He has the identity, maybe his truer identity, the one at night when he's uh, dealing in science and digging up carcasses and things like that, and the identity that he shows to the world, the dutiful son, the future husband, that sort of thing. So this is a novel about how identity is created. Um, another quote uh, here from The Monster of Frankenstein. I was delighted when I first discovered that a pleasant sound proceeded from the throats of the little winged birds. Um, this is about the acquisition of language. This is about what kind of identity here, I think, is being constructed. He's interested in birds and butterflies and the sound of water. These things, I would argue, are good. And it's going to lead us to, I think, a fundamental question that the novel asks. The science and the, uh, not this, but we're going to get to it. The science and the enlightenment against what it means to feel or to be engaged in the romantic tradition. So we have uh, Cornelius Agrippa, who is uh, a kind of pseudo-scientist, a mystic. But what glory would attend discovery if I could banish disease from the human frame and render man invulnerable to any but a violent death? And the monster, quote from him, uh, quote, increase of knowledge only discovered to me what a wretched outcast I was. So I think the novel plays with uh, you know, the science and the enlightenment and control and rigor and all of those sorts of things against the romantic, who in this case, Dr. Frankenstein has combined science, but rather than following uh, any sort of moral or ethical code or the scientific method, has allowed the deeper part of the human psyche to, t to take over his darker emotions. So there's a kind of uh, antagonism between the earlier period of enlightenment and how science is framed and utilized in the Romantic period. This is a novel about reproduction, and this, uh, uh, you know, intersects the conversation about technology. Um, you know that we look at Dr. Frankenstein as a creator, uh, which has you know biblical implications, um, but. Uh, Dr. Frankenstein is, is a father, and he has the opportunity to be a father if he married Elizabeth and had children, i.e. the natural ways most of us reproduce and have children and families and things like that. But it's interesting because Dr. Frankenstein doesn't want that, or he doesn't want that with Elizabeth, but he does want to become a kind of father, not a very good one, because he runs away. So this, I think, you know, this is about the responsibility. What are the responsibilities, not only of the scientist, but also about being a parent? And then finally, <clears throat> where is sexual desire? Where can we locate sexual desire in this text? And one of the arguments that I would make is we don't really see it. Um, we don't see it between Elizabeth and Dr. Frankenstein. There is no sort of sexual tension or desire between them at all. And I think that's important. So questions that this novel, I think, poses to us. Um, and there are a, an abundance of questions. These are just a few of them. Are people inherently good or evil? That's a sort of $64,000 question. Is this, you know, we are born... Uh, tabula rasa, are we born with a blank slate and our experiences create who we are, um, whether we become good people or bad people, or are people inherently good? It seemed to me, I think there's an argument, well, uh, lots of ways to argue that, but it seemed to me, I mean, when the, when the monster woke up, he was interested in birds. Birds are pretty. Birds are nice. Birds are fun. Birds are good. So that might be an argument that we are born good. And it is through perhaps social antagonism and prejudice and violence that people turn 
not good. What is the influence of one's upbringing, family, or memory? Are we born or do we learn to be prejudiced, racist, or violent? What are the conditions that create identity? Can we overcome or correct our human shortcomings that are both natural and learned? Okay, so what I've done here is what I uh, would like you folks to do, those who are listening to this uh, presentation, whether you are one of my students, somebody else's student, or looking for an intellectual exercise, I suppose. I've constructed an introductory paragraph with a thesis statement. I'm gonna start a little bit broad, a little bit conversational to draw you in, and I'm making an argument. And uh, uh, like all writing, it um, uh, always needs a little bit more work, but I'm using this as an example. Loneliness is a powerful emotion, and often people avoid it and seek companionship and love. Oh, that sounds interesting. Tell me more. Sometimes I feel lonely. This sounds interesting. What's this about? In Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein abandons his child, the monster. And after the monster commits murder, Dr. Frankenstein ignores the warnings that the killings will continue unless he makes a companion for him. Even though the monster warns Dr. Frankenstein that he, the monster, will be present on Dr. Frankenstein's wedding night, Dr. Frankenstein still destroys the monster's desired friend slash future wife perpetuating the intended violence, and follows through with marrying Elizabeth. While the text details the unfair treatment between the social classes and the pressures peasants experience because of their poverty, and you'll see from my earlier comments where I've been going with this, Dr. Frankenstein idealizes the poor as free. Now I'm going to bring these things together. On the other hand, Dr. Frankenstein perceives himself as imprisoned, this facilitates the creation of the monster as a tool to destroy and ultimately free Frankenstein from familial, social, and marital obligations. What is it that I would be trying, if I had time, to write this? And I would love to do so. Don't have time. You don't have a choice. Many of you, if you're my student, you have to write uh, on, on Frankenstein or one of the other texts we have. Um, what am I arguing here? I'm arguing a couple of things. One, that Dr. Frankenstein fantasizes about those who are farmers or peasants, that they have less responsibility than he does. Even though they don't have money, they have less responsibilities. How does Dr. Frankenstein get out of those responsibilities? Whether consciously or unconsciously, he creates the monster and lets the monster loose to kill members of his family, including Elizabeth, to free him of his obligations. If I was writing this paper, that is the argument here that I set forth. Okay, that's the uh, wrap-up of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I hope you found it helpful. Thank you.